See, look at her teeth. Look at my teeth. I had braces <laughs> twice and jaw surgery. She had nothing. And her teeth, teeth are perfect. What's going on, guys? I am here with the lovely young Meg. And she has had varying experiences with both vegetarian and vegan diets, uh, both herself from suffering from heart palpitations uh, to her family from her grandmother's dementia, her mother's eating problems, as well as her father's, well, essentially veganism made her father a hunchback. So I'm going to let her take this away and tell you guys her story. Thank you. Uh, thank you for having me. So when I was a kid, um, essentially like my, my family has a lot of German background. So my Oma, for those who don't know, means grandma in German. Um, she basically raised me. I lived with my mom and my Oma when I was a kid. I would eat a lot of eggs, lots and lots of eggs, always had hard boiled eggs on hand and omelets, cheesy omelets. Um, and so essentially I, I really had a very whole foods, whole cooked diet when I was growing up. My mom always has been cooking lots of different dishes, lots of different um, styles of cooking as well. We would always experiment and bake. Um, and when I was uh, 11, that's in 2010, we decided we were going to start doing more plant-based. So essentially my parents were recovering alcoholics and my mom wanted to detox and she wanted to um, completely cleanse her system um, they both cut out alcohol cold turkey they haven't drank since and my my parents um, essentially what we started doing was we would just have like zero processed foods in the house and that helped you know my mom did feel good we didn't really have too many processed foods to begin with but when we cut them out we started to feel really good and so then when I was 11 we um, were watching a lot of documentaries about you know the planet and, and certain things. A lot of the documentaries we watched were Cowspiracy, Forks Over Dives. Um, there were a couple other ones regarding like Monsanto and things, and then also uh, Earthlings. I do think there are a lot of truths to some of them, to some varying extent. You know, I don't think people should support the multi-trillion dollar industry. You know, that's that's, that's a, yeah. con a conglomerate, including the pharmaceutical and big ag. Right, regardless of whether it's plant agriculture or animal agriculture, yeah, it's all toxic. That's the point people seem to miss. Yeah. Yes. If you're, if you're not buying your food from a local farm, you can't argue about the environment. That's my no. point. Like yeah. if I'm, I'm, I have some guy coming. I'm, I spend way too much money per week on meat just because I know the quality and it's local and stuff like that. So, what are you gonna do? Yeah, exactly. Well, and I'm very lucky because I live in Alberta, which is Cowtown, is the nickname. So we have just huge plots of land when you'll be driving on the road the main road and you'll see cows and horses just grazing like um i'm very grateful but um back then like we were just seeing all these things and me when i was you know at the time like it was really sad and scary to see these the way the animals were being treated of course those images though came from the factory not farms. looking out your window not looking out your window not with the cows looking out my field. window <laughs> exactly. Um, but so that's when we were like, okay, no red meat. And my mom had a lot of gut issues. And partly she knew that that was from the alcohol consumption earlier in, in time. But she wanted to um, really detox and, and fix her gut. And so detox. my mom, yeah, <laughs> my mom, she, what she, um, we started to do was no more beef, no more pork, red meat. We cut out dairy. We stopped buying that. It's, it's um, funny, like, it's, you know, the logic here, she goes from drinking, like, how much vodka or whatever to, like, now cutting out meat is the problem when she was drinking all this alcohol. It just it doesn't make much sense, but what are you going to do? There was, like, a year gap between being sober and going vegan. Um, so it did, it was, like, a, a bit of a transition. Um but yeah, well, my mom has always had issues eating grains. So a lot of grains like bread, you know, for instance, my mom would get stomach upset. So she knew that she didn't want to eat too much of that. But um, because we would usually eat, you know, all these plant foods with the meat, my mom at first thought, oh, it's the meat. I should cut that out. Um, 
and all these things saying like meat doesn't digest in your gut it just sits there and rots right like we were listening meat, to that. meat turns your blood into acid didn't did you hear no i never heard that one. <laughs> oh, you didn't hear the meat is acidic thing <laughs> no <laughs> i'm surprised you haven't to be honest <laughs> but um after you know after we cut out like mainly red meat and stuff we would eat chicken occasionally and we would still eat like ahi tuna shrimp and salmon my mom really loved seafood and i hated it when i was a kid mainly i was a really picky eater regarding mushrooms and like spinach and things like that and that's what i hated when i was a kid and like chewy things you know but um so i always thought that seafood was kind of chewy but we kind of went i guess you could say pescatarian and then we went fully like vegetarian and we just completely didn't buy like those you know fish or seafood and that's when my mom's stomach pains, you know, like she was being really bloated. She was getting a lot of bloating and um, acid reflux. And my dad, he worked a very taxing job as a shipper receiver for like a warehouse. So he um, he was getting, you know, like for, for 20 years when he worked there, he had zero issues. He would walk to work every single day and he started getting tired he was more tired and you know he was only like you know in his 30s so for him to be so tired at the time when he had been doing it for so long it was just it was kind of like you know he was just getting I don't know he was deteriorating like he was just he wasn't acting normal and over the course of the time that we were vegan as well he started getting a lot more joint pains and like an old man like it really hurt me because, like, he would need to use both of his arms to, like, push himself to get off the couch because um, his knees were s in so much pain. Um, so severe joint pain. And this was because of the being this was, the plant-based or this was? Yeah, this was after we went vegan and it was about two years after being vegan. Myself, um, being strict vegan, um, I noticed that my skin was becoming really dry. And so my skin was so dry from when I was like 13 all the way to, um, you know, basically until for the last couple of months. But especially when I was vegan, I looked scaly. Like my skin looked like I was a reptile. It was so dry. No oils, no makeup could cover it. Nothing helped my skin. I would try dozens of oils. Olive oil was like the only thing that helped me when it was on. And I looked like a grease ball. But the moment that the oil, the, yeah, the moment yeah, the oil was of off. Italians today? What's going on? <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> Actually, my dad is Italian, so <laughs> I have the right. No, I don't believe that. But, um, yeah, like, it just, it was really bad. And I started getting severe acne as well. My, like, I would break out. And, you know, beginning when I was in junior high and stuff, I never had acne. I never had any spots. The, when we had been vegan for a couple months and we eventually were vegan, you know, like through the entire first year that we were vegan, I started getting these serious subcutaneous pimples. And I had them the entire time we were vegan. I would just get them on my chin. Like I would get a fucking third eye. <laughs> it was really bad. It was really embarrassing. And they would just, they were so painful. They were like volcanoes. And when they erupted, it was disgusting. It was bad. Um, my dad, you know, we uh, we discovered like he had a uh, like a cyst on his back that was like the size of an edamame bean. Like the cyst on his back, like the doctor said, like it it doesn't do anything. It's just there, you know. It it has no contributions to your health or anything, so don't worry about it. Like he just said that there's nothing to worry about it, um, and so eventually like it was growing and it, it kept getting bigger and it stunk for the end of our for us yeah but like when I mean, we were like first he vegan, smelled like he smelled he smelled bad the cyst on his back and it was coming from the cyst it was it, it was really bad and my mom like she was like don't sleep with me <laughs> don't sleep with me um my family has always had really long hair and fingernails. My Oma always had really long nails. And my nails over the course was, they were becoming very brittle and dry. And they were just breaking very, because they were just breaking. Um, and my Oma 
being somebody who's very important in my life. She actually, um, right, like right after For we. For those went of you that don't know, Oma, Oma is grandma in German, right? Yes. Yes. Yeah, yeah. Sorry, okay. I don't know if I said that at first. It it is uh, grandma in German. Um, so my Oma in. You know, right after we went plant-based, she was diagnosed with early onset Lewy body dementia. And so what happened was we got her in a home and in the home they were feeding her a lot of processed foods and there was a lot of abuse in the home as well. So we wanted her to live with us and we would package, we would make extra food, extra vegan food, and we would meal prep it and package it and freeze it and bring it to her so she could dethaw it and eat it. And um you know she was only in the home for three months maybe but she while she was there we were noticing she was forgetting phrases she was forgetting words she was blank for a couple minutes she would just like lose like she would just fall out of it zone out you know so we wanted her to live with us so we moved to a fifth house you know and um my oma came with us it was a bungalow and when we were there um I was in grade nine at the time. I was 14. And these pimples on my skin were getting worse. I was getting a lot of redness in my skin. Um, and I would have just, um, like again, the dry skin was getting so much worse, preferably around my nose. But it started spreading into my cheeks. And it started spreading around my chin as well. And it was just getting so bad. Then we, there was a health food store that opened up around us. So we got jobs there. I actually worked there. My mom worked there. And um, it was an interesting environment. There were actually a lot of creepy people that worked there. But when I was 14, you know, it was right before high school. And I started having, um, like, it felt like what, at first what we thought it was, was like heartburn. Um, and so we would treat it like that. I would take Tums. Eventually we read But you were very internet. young. Heartburn at what age? 13, 14? Like, you 14. Know, like, yeah. Yeah. Mm. So I had, I had no idea what it was. And it, my mom was reading online and she, it, she saw that um, somewhere it said that drinking baking soda in water would help. So I would do that. And then I would drink apple cider vinegar. And that would like help. And then I would drink apple cider vinegar with baking soda in it. And that would like help for a little bit, but it never really, it never went away. And it was very like, just when I breathed in and then when I was, a, when I stopped breathing to exhale, I just get this sharp pain and it just, it was like right under my left breast. Like it was just really bad. Um, like I was getting stabbed and it was very mild at first, and it it would happen sporadically throughout the week for about uh, like a month or two, and it would just happen randomly. And I started having like heart palpitations where I would like it would race. I would just I would just feel my heart beating really fast, and you know that would happen also just kind of occasionally. These the pains, the sharp pains, eventually. Go kept getting so much worse. I was at a friend's house one night and then I ended up going to the hospital because um, I, I just couldn't breathe. I actually stopped breathing because it was so painful. My uh, Eventually I got transferred to a cardiologist because they couldn't figure out what was wrong with me. They had no idea. And when I went to the cardiologist, I was tested. I was doing a bunch of tests and then I was wearing like a heart monitor and I had all these patches on that I had to wear for a week. And then I got in, um, I also had, uh, oh shoot, what is it called again? They do it for, you know, pregnant bellies. I had that done on my heart. Yeah, heart scan. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Um, heart, maybe myocardiogram. I can't remember the name of it. I don't know what, something familiar. Uh, but yeah, I'm curious, did they ask you about your diet or anything? No, no, so they this never is, did. You know, you would, so people who have heart palpitations related to dietary issues, whether it's vitamin deficiencies, histamine intolerances. It, from the medical perspective, it seems incredibly difficult to figure out what the point, the, the underlying issue is because you could have something like small intestinal bacteria overgrowth or candida, and that would only be diagnosed by like a naturopath. You could have something in your case, but like a B12 deficiency. And if you go to a cardiologist and they see, oh, girl is 14, heart problems, they think you took some drugs, you know, 
Uh, yeah. it's, it's hard for them to know. They're not going to think, oh, this girl's vegan and has a vitamin B12 deficiency because how many vegans does this doctor have? And how many, you know, it, it, it seems like a very rare scenario. And I mean, it's hard to pinpoint whether or not um, it was a B12 deficiency. But you said that once you started eating, uh, you know, you were vegan for about a year strictly. That's when this problem got worse and worse and worse. But then when you started eating these animal foods again at your friend's house, it almost went away instantly. Yeah, actually. So, um, and then there was this one night when I was going to go rafting with my friend in, in a couple of days and I was sleeping over cause she lived right across from me and I was having these sharp pains again. And I was, I was staying over for dinner. It wasn't as bad as the time that I got went, that I went to the hospital. Um, but it, again, like it just felt like, like a knife just like stabbing into me and it, I couldn't breathe, but her family made lasagna for dinner and they weren't vegan. So there was beef in it. And, um, like I ate some lasagna and like I felt I felt really good and I wasn't having the pains like it was very just subtle and I was still having the heart palpitations but when I was breathing that stabbing feeling like wasn't happening so um and so eventually like I slept over that night and I would come over again and, and I would just I just wasn't sticking to the vegan diet so I had been vegan from when I was 12 to when I was 14 and so when I was 14 that's when I stopped um, taking veganism very seriously. I was still vegan at home because uh, my mom was strict vegan, my dad was strict vegan. But when I was, um, you know, going out to friends' houses, I would eat what they were eating. And let's just be clear: you were following. You know, your mother was doing a lot of home cooking. This was not some BS vegan diet. But I think a lot of things that the vegans are, the vegans are going to point out here is, oh, she wasn't supplementing B12. But you could argue up and down. You didn't do a vegan diet, right? But if a vegan diet is so hard to do and you need a laboratory to do it correctly, I think there's an issue inherent with the diet. And it, it's just to me for them to try to just they, they will always try to justify whatever the issue is. But did you just want to go over that? You know, you were kind of consuming a whole foods plant based diet to some degree. Yes, my mom was cooking really good food. Like, my mom always cooked, and we would cook, um, like, Brazilian dishes. My mom actually went to Sao Paulo. We would cook beans and rice. We would have lentils. We would have all sorts of different legumes. We would eat mung beans, which were supposedly really high in protein. Um, and we also had vitamins. We would take tons of vitamins. I would take 13 vitamins a day. So I had this little... Well? One of it was a multivitamin specifically for so, women. So you probably, so you probably actually, so scratch what I said earlier, you might've actually been getting some B12 supplement. Maybe it just wasn't high enough. Who knows? And, and th the problem with supplements is these vegans might have higher blood levels of B12, but that's not indicative of tissue levels. And you can't exactly take a liver biopsy of a person that's alive. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, fair enough. Well, and I, I would take all of my vitamins in one gulp. So, um, like, you know, I would take them every single day diligently. We would um, take omega-3s. They were a vegan omega-3, though. But, um, yeah, so we would we were doing that. And my Oma, she was declining much worse. And my mom, her gut issues they were so they were getting more severe she was having serious pains um like she was just on her side laying on the couch for hours she couldn't move because she was in so much pain physically her stomach would cramp um and she was like just having so much acid reflux my oma was getting um much worse so what we started doing was we would research more about foods that she needed and we knew that you know like the brain tissue specifically needs fat so we were giving her everything and it came to a point where we were still vegan but my mom started buying f animal product foods for my oma well it was really hard to find a yogurt that had high fat content like so many would be like seven grams of fat i'm not kidding for like two or for like two-thirds of a cup and like 21 carbohydrates, you know, like it's, and that was sugar, right? Just, that was just insane. to not to, sorry to interrupt you, but if you go into any supermarket in America, I have literally been in supermarkets and you can't find any fatty yogurt. It's all zero grams of fat, 20 grams of sugar. It yeah. doesn't exist. It's bad. So we found this one that came from, you know, the, the city it wasn't organic, but, um, 
or my, my province, sorry, it wasn't organic, but it had 18 grams of fat per two and a, two thirds of a cup, which was the most that and any actually, of them in, had. Indian, Indian specialty stores and other cultures would probably have it, but uh, unfortunately the, the standardized stuff, they usually, they usually don't. Yeah, they cut it out. It's bad. Um, but we would just buy the fattiest foods that we could for my Oma. And they were animal fats, really. And we started making, because eventually she was bed bound and we needed to feed her. And then eventually she couldn't chew, so we had to make her shakes. And the doctors tried to give her Ensure. And so my mom was like, this shit is disgusting. You know, like Gerber is disgusting. And it's basically the same thing. The first ingredient is sugar. My Oma developed thrush, which she already had a lot of problems. Uh, not to mention bed sores because she was bed bound and then changing her diaper and things like that. It was a really stressful thing for my mom. So I know that the stress of that also contributed to my health and my depression as well. But um, for, you know, for a while, we, what we were doing was we were giving her soft foods and these shakes. And my mom would put in three different kinds of whey protein, a bunch of different kinds of other um, supplements and milk, whole milk, um, which now only I buy whole Jersey milk from an organic farmer um, where I live, which is, it's, I love the cream, the fat. I never knew that existed because when it's, I would buy skim milk. It's absolutely insane. It's so, it's so delicious. It's amazing. Like I fucking love it on toast, you know, and I usually like, I like making homemade bread. Like my mom would too. The ingredients, it's literally yeast flour and water. Like it's insane. But um, anyways, uh, which, you know, because when I would drink skim milk when I was a kid, I had no idea. Like when I first bought whole milk, I was like, mom, what is this stuff on the top? And my mom was like, no, that's just the cream. Like that's natural. It's supposed to be there. But um, then, you know, my Oma started to stabilize and she actually we still needed to take her to the hospital several times. We would call the ambulance and just just always she would get transferred to the hospital. Um, one night we were at the hospital from, uh, we got there at 7 p.m. and we weren't able to leave until 4 a.m. because we had to wait for an entire transfer process to find a room and everything like that. It was just ridiculous. But since my mom and I were so tired and it was 4 a.m., we had been up since 7 a.m. the morning before, we, um, we just, we were craving something. that So we got mac and cheese. And I was, you know, um, 15 at the time. And it was around that time when I started cheating more. You know, even when we would go out, like, we never really ate out. But th through the time that we were vegan, when I would, we would maybe go out and eat to, like, a restaurant, like, once every two years. Very rarely. And when we did, you know, my mom would say, like, oh, you know, you, you guys can get whatever you want. So we would get, like, a an Alfredo pasta or something. My mom was fine with that. My my mom herself, though, she was very strict. But we, we, you know, we were missing nostalgic foods that my Oma used to cook. And we had been in the hospital all night. So we started to eat some of these foods. And we felt really good. We felt really satisfied. And so, you know, my mom was starting to really question this vegan diet. Um, living, like, you know having all sorts of home care come in to take care of my Oma as well. That really helped. My, my mom started doing, my mom started experimenting with other diets. And so she would always cook my sisters and I food every single night for dinner. But she herself decided that she was going to try some raw food. Like she was going to go raw for a little bit. That didn't last very long because she was getting more severe stomach pains. She was having them for so long. Can you just uh, give a time span of your mother's experience with veganism and the problems she ran into? Yeah, so um, for the, um, back in 2011 to uh, 2014, or sorry, 15, my mom was vegan, and, you know, about two years after being vegan, like, my mom was having more severe stomach pains, which she had already had bad stomach pains throughout the entire thing. Her bloating was getting much worse. About halfway through being vegan, my mom was throwing everything up and she didn't want to like the thing was my mom was craving 
food. She wanted to eat. We, she would see my sisters and I, my dad eating, and she was jealous. She would try and eat, and she would keep it down for about 10 minutes and then go to the toilet and throw up. Now, let me interject here. For any of you vegans saying eating disorder, eating disorder, eating disorder, this woman was physically incapable of consuming these foods. It's like if you drank battery acid and your body wanted to vomit it up. That's essentially what's happening. She's drinking some, uh, eating something, drinking something. It gets her sick, food poisoning, just like food poisoning, essentially. She's vomiting the food up unintentionally. She's not purging at the toilet. She, she's trying to eat these vegan foods, and her body's rejecting them, and she's throwing them up. That's essentially what's happening, right? Yes, she would throw up after every single meal. And it was very bad. And she was very sick. She was always bloated. And these pains in her stomach were so severe. And, you know, it would be good in the morning. She would wake up in the morning with an empty stomach. And she would feel okay. It was the moment she started to eat food. It was all vegan. Because she was very strict. And she threw it up every single meal. And she was very stressed. She was already stressed with my Oma. But, you know the eating problem like it was it was involuntary like she she tried we would experiment with all sorts of different foods so essentially what my mom did was she went on a juice cleanse for 60 days 90 days maybe i don't remember if it was 90 or 60 days but she went on a juice cleanse pure juice nothing else and she felt really good she started to lose a little bit of weight at the time she also started to get more into um like running and yoga and things like that. Um, but she she stuck with this juice cleanse. And then after she was over, she decided she was going to try introducing these foods again. And she was immediately sick. Immediately sick. Um, and throwing up. And so essentially, you know, what would happen was... And her stool was really bad. That was another thing that she really had trouble with. But you, but, you mentioned your mother had trouble with these foods even when eating meat though yeah she did she knew that she had a trouble she she knew before we went vegan that eating grains like bread that she had a problem with and that she couldn't consume too much of it mm -hmm. um and then so what happened was after she did a salt water cleanse for like a month or something like that um she eventually decided to do like a process of elimination diet and so now you know after doing that the moment she ate potatoes, she felt immediately sick. She cannot eat beans, any kind of bean, any kind of legume. She will throw it up. Um, grains, corn, soy. She cannot eat any of these foods. And it's actually, she got tested. These are allergies for her. Nightshade, now, legume. They never were before. Mm -hmm. But they're allergies now. And when she went to the doctor about a, a year ago, um, or maybe, sorry, closer to six months, the doctor said that, um, you know, because of eating too many, like she had changed her diet. We weren't vegan. I'll backtrack a little bit. Um, in, when I was in grade 11, uh, we decided that we were going to have Thanksgiving dinner with Turkey. It was the, like one of the last years that my Oma was still really able to eat with us. We still had to make everything very soft for her, but, um, she would, uh, eat, you know, we wanted, we wanted to have Turkey dinner like we used to. With, like she used to cook and we felt better and one thing we were afraid of was that tale that once you go vegan when you try and eat meat you'll feel sick complete bullshit it was bullshit, bullshit. it was bullshit um but so we started you know like we ate this turkey and we all loved it like we were like it was amazing so my mom was like hey we're not gonna be vegan anymore you know this is not working for me we were still very plant based though we were still we still believed that that's, plants yeah, are good it's so it's so ingrained in culture it's in, it's unbelievable it is it's, you could see all this evidence like someone could shoot like someone could shoot your baby in front of you but like if you said oh they're a doctor that's okay that's it's crazy what people believe uh, but just to touch on what happens in vegans and this is something we see over and over and over again is they start consuming high amounts of these plant foods that have high levels of anti-nutrients. And every single thing that your mother mentioned, potatoes, legumes, grains, there's various anti-nutrients from phytates to lectins to oxalates that can cause inflammation in the gut. And in the context of a diet where you're actually consuming high amounts of meat or animal foods, it's not as much of an issue. One, because you're not consuming as much of them. And two, because there's nutrients in the meat that 
you're getting that are absent that that are crucial for various metabolic functions. So the combination of increasing these inflammatory things and reduction of anti-inflammatory animal foods, as much as people don't believe that, it's up, that's why there's an explanation for it. And it happens over and over and over again. These vegans go on, they go on a vegan diet, they become intolerant to every single food, and they try to do all these cleanses and go raw. It's like clockwork. I, gotta, I probably have to do a whole video explaining the mechanisms of how veganism fails people. I mean, it's, yeah. uh, may, I, I should really do that. Let me write that down. But, uh, I'll let you uh, continue. You were saying, uh, uh, so you touched on your mother's health problems. You, you touched on how, um, you guys started eating meat again, but did we touch, we touched on the father too. Uh, we, I think we talked about the cyst. Um, I was just going to get to that. Mm-hmm. Um, All right, I'm yeah, sorry. Like, we could, we could edit this out. Okay. Did we, did we talk about that yet? Or was that in the other conversation? We did. How it smelled. We did touch on that in this one, right? A little bit, a little bit. Yeah. But you did say that his cyst smelled, right? And the uh... I'll get yeah, I'll get I'll get into that again though. Like I'll I'll touch on that a little bit. But wait, as well. what was the, what was the context of you saying it that you like your mother didn't? That was definitely in this conversation, right? Yes. Yeah, my mother would say like, "Don't sleep with me." <laughs> uh, okay. Uh, so what was next? What did you want to go? So, um, my dad's like the cyst on his back throughout the time that we were vegan, it started to get bigger and it went from the size of like an edamame bean to a dove soap bar. It was big. And like, I didn't want to touch it. Um, it looked bad. It kept getting worse. The veins around it started getting worse. It was red. Um, like the whole area was red and the cyst, like it wasn't causing him any pain. And I was like, don't sleep on your back. Like what if it pops or anything? But, uh, like, I didn't know how it worked, but eventually the end of us being vegan for the last um, half a year that we were vegan, it started to smell and it started to smell really bad. It started to like, like, like moldy, moldy cheese and feet. Like it was just, it was bad smell, very bad smell. And um, then like what would happen was my dad's joint pain was getting a lot worse as well. Um, and so he was having so much trouble. He actually got a different job, um, as well. That was less labor intensive. So he's, he's a manager still, but like it just requires less moving and less lifting. And, um, so essentially like my parents, when we worked at this health food store as well, we were getting a lot of information from them and there are a lot of hippies that worked there and pardon my language for anybody who doesn't like the term hippie. Um, but these people, I can't believe how hateful they were. You know, when I was a vegan, the entire time I was vegan from when I was, you know, 11 years old being vegetarian, but 12 was when I started being vegan. And from then until, you know, when I was done with it, um, I was never hateful to people who ate meat. Like I wasn't, you know, I just thought, okay, well, they're just, they just don't know, you know, they just, they just need to be educated, but they can, they can do that on their own time. Like I'm not going to preach at them. Huh? Like, the number of people who worked there that were just very rude to you if you weren't vegan and were very hateful, it was a very aggressive group, you know? And when we started buying animal foods for my Oma, we got so much hate from these people that when we first started working there were super friendly to us. And they were just like, you know, they would talk behind my mom's back when I was working with like to me. And I'd be like, excuse me, you know, um, this is my family uh, don't know, but, um, and there were like, you know, this is a little bit off topic, but a lot of the people that worked there that were vegan stole a lot. They stole a lot. So we, we don't, what we can talk about here is like perception and how these people, these hippie vegans are perceiving on the outside. You think, oh, they're trying to do things for the environment. They're friendly people. They're all for good. But if you actually knew their intentions and how they act to other people, it's completely disgusting. It's it's covered up a lot. It's like, uh, a, it's like some I don't know what a good analogy for this is. Perhaps uh, a religious leader, like you know those people that preach the Bible and get you to donate half your bank account to the church. Yeah. It seems like that. It's like on the outside, oh, it's this holy evangelical person, but reality, what he's doing is dirtbag shit. And that's what these vegans are doing too. People just don't perceive it as that initially, uh, and then until it you know, blows up in their face. 
this guy who worked there too, I had a really bad experience. Oops, sorry, I hit my mic. I had a really bad experience because this guy who worked there was 11 years older than me. I was 15 at the time and he was like major into me and it was a very big problem. And like, the thing was, I was young and naive, and the, there was this, it was a big community of people who, who worked there. They would all hang out, so I wanted to hang out with all of them, not just him specifically, but all of them, and I wanted to learn about the supplements that we would sell, because like, you know, chlorella, spirulina, um, chaga, all the different mushrooms, plus, you know, like bee pollen and, and things like that, which I know bee pollen is not vegan, but a lot of them would eat it. Um, but I wanted to learn about that kind of stuff. Hey, it and doesn't have eyes and a heart, so why not eat it, right? <laughs> Just like they don't care about insects. They don't give half a shit about insects. All the bees that are struggling, too, because of big ag. Yeah, you could, That's the thing. Like, a vegan doesn't understand that in their bowl of cereal, there's probably about 10, 10 fly parts in it. So I don't want to get I into am. that. There's so much so much contradictory stuff. Coloring. To coloring insects oh, for color. It's, it's, Nat natural and, color. And it, just you're living in a house. How many pro how many how much how many animal products went into the drywall into all these products that are built in your house that are needed, you know? It's uh, everything. It's and everywhere. and what's what's the and, and this sounds silly, but what about people that do services for you? What about if those people eat meat, are they not allowed to service you? Like like what's going on? It, it the, the the environmental, the moral thing gets really foggy, but it can uh, be yeah, debated. So overall uh, you know, you had, you know, the notable thing for you was the heart, your, your heart was like, felt like it was going to explode when you were younger for your mother, very severe, obviously food allergies and tolerances. She could not be vegan father, the cystic pimple on his back or whatever it was, it got worse. I'm sure they extracted some tofu out of it when they were done with it. And then of course your grandmother's dementia, uh, we didn't really emphasize it too much, but when you started feeding her the animal foods, it got essentially, so it's what people need, yeah, what I didn't talk about was. When someone is older, their body is no longer really creating new cells. It's kind of just degenerating. So you can't really, it's hard to heal or reverse symptoms in older people. What yeah. you could do is you could slow the symptoms, but you can't necessarily uh, reverse them. That is an impossible feat at that age, at least. And then we had the, uh, yeah, the issues. I'm just trying to think of what other points we had. Um, oh, but your father also was no longer able to physically do his job and had all these physical problems and physical ailments, too. Joint uh, pains. It's it's really amazing how it's crazy. You know, veganism essentially ruined every aspect of your life and your family's life. It's not ruined it, but greatly diminished the quality of life. Yes. And it's it was just oh, whatever. You know, it's 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 absolutely it's so unfortunate that I mean, but that's can be said about conventional wisdom, that could be said about standard American diets. Like at the end of the day, what are you gonna do? It's it's yeah, my mom actually also started to um, nearly develop ulcers. Like the doctors were like, you're, de you're going to start developing ulcers. The symptoms are there. You need to do something. So what she did was she started drinking bone broth. We would make our own bone broth. And because we're so close to um, farmers in our province, um, we were able to buy really good sourced meats, really, really well sourced um, chicken. And we would use the feet the chicken feet and everything like that and since then my mom was getting a lot better she started to heal um and you know then my mom was having still some pains and she would still throw up occasionally and she couldn't pinpoint what it was and it was when she was eating fruit fruit and um like it would be like she would eat a hard-boiled egg for breakfast with uh, like a couple other things and then she would have um you know maybe some like berries after and then she would throw it up. She would get really sick. And I said, you know, because I had started getting into more of it, like more YouTubers and things like that, like yourself and a couple other um, doctors and stuff. And I was saying, well, maybe it's the con combination of eating those foods. So my mom stopped. And now, you know, eating, you know, hard boiled eggs for breakfast and keeping it very close to a paleo diet but not completely like she doesn't follow any specific diet she just eats what she wants now but it's mainly meat and mm -hmm. she's been feeling better her hair is growing back that was another thing she started to lose hair she would get clumps of hair my nails were so brittle but now like i'm keeping my nails very very long and yeah, just, so let's touch on this. You're a carnivore girl now, so you've noticed your skin has been improving. You've yes. noticed your nails are growing better. You've noticed uh, your your energy level's good. Yeah, I feel incredible. Like, I've always loved yoga. 
um, and stretching and flexibility. And my boyfriend's always been pushing me to gain weight and do more more bodybuilding kind of things. Mm -hmm. um, but a big problem, and part of it was depression um, because of losing my Oma, especially in the way that she did. The, the ambiguous grief was really hard on all of us. But um, for the last six months, I've been just eating basically bacon every single morning for breakfast. For the last three months, I've had bacon every single morning straight with eggs every day. My skin is not dry at all. These The reptilian skin is completely gone. My nails are not brittle at all. My hair has always grown really fast, but it's maintaining moisture. It's not as dry and frizzy. Um, and like my spots, I couldn't believe it. Like I've been using, and that's another thing for about two weeks now, I've been putting bacon grease on my face, which I know sounds disgusting, but it feels amazing. And my blackheads, the one thing I would have never thought, my blackheads are gone. And the pimples that I have now are just scabs that are healing from previous pimples beforehand. But otherwise, I haven't developed anything. My skin is clearing up. And it is soft. And it's just, I'm, I'm very happy with it. There's definitely something to be said about removing inflammation in the diet. Um, one other, other interesting thing I wanted to touch on was your sister is older than you. And she actually is a bit taller than you also. Um, yes. So you are, you said you were five feet tall and your sister was five foot five. And uh, yeah, you guys can call me crazy, whatever you want, but um, I'm going to make some assumptions here. So uh, obviously you, some, some guys get like, you're like, Frank, you have this beautiful young girl on your podcast and you're talking about her facial structure. Are you gay? That is what they usually say. So there's some <laughs> silly stuff. But what I was going to say was obviously, you know, you, what I notice is you have very symmetrical, well-developed lips, uh, you know, very pretty face. So obviously, you know, we can assume that the eggs, the butter you were eating when you were younger might have contributed to the proper facial development, but you're relatively short, you know, I mean, you're five feet tall. So your sister though, who was not plant-based. Yeah. She never was, was vegan. Was significantly taller than you. We mean five, six inches taller. So uh, I just want to throw this out there. I don't want to touch on it too much. I, I do sincerely believe that the role of animal protein in the diet and fat soluble vitamins plays an incredible role in height, but uh, we can't complain. We're both short and pretty, right? Who cares? Yes. I'd rather be short and pretty than some tall, older looking person, right? Well, I always, when I was a kid, okay, I, I have memories back to when I was 18 months and I went to see The Lord of the Rings when I was two in theaters. It's my favorite movie ever since, um, but the elves... I loved the elves and I always wanted to be an elf. And then um, like when I was a kid, Tinkerbell was like my spirit animal because like everybody would call me Tinkerbell because I'm very, very small. You know, people say my cat's big, but I'm like, no, I'm just five feet, five feet tall and 90 pounds. <laughs> like I'm, I'm a small person. My cat is normal. <laughs> it's just me. <laughs> but thank you. Yeah. I do contribute a lot of my health to, um, eating a lot of whole foods when I was a kid. Mm -hmm. You know, we would eat um, so many eggs just every single day. I had an egg, I had more than one egg every single day and all home cooking as well with the exception of a couple processed foods, which was a treat. You know, it was like maybe once a month when I would go out and get Wendy's. It mm -hmm. was never, it was never food we ate. It mm -hmm. was a treat. And so, I knew. Yeah. You've never had braces, right? I've never had braces. Can you, do you mind smiling for the... See, look at her teeth. Look at my teeth. I had braces <laughs> twice and jaw surgery. She had nothing. And her teeth, teeth are perfect. 100% perfect. Oh, thank you. See, so you guys like... I, I mean, this parallel is weird to make, but something very basic like how your face develops is specifically determined by the nutrition you receive through these developmental stages. And you've... You're not wearing contacts, right? No. I'm, no I, I, had, I had LASIK eye surgery. So here we have an example of, you know, you had these nutrients when you were younger. And then, interestingly enough, you didn't have them through the stages where people typically finish their growth plates, you know, the skeletal structure. So yeah. I think this, I think honestly, like you guys can say, oh, Frank, you're crazy. This is all anecdotal stuff. To me, this is black and white spelled out very clearly, you know? She had nutrition during developmental stages, 
and the developmental stages of her life that require nutrition that determines certain aspects, such as her facial development, her lips, her teeth, her eyes. She had nutrition during those periods, so those are developed. But then, you know, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15, 16, 17, 18, no nutrition, no height. But, all right, that's enough speculation for me. 10, 20 years from now, you guys can say Frank was right. But you guys can give me all the shit you want right now. But this is my, and for those of you guys who are wondering where I got this from, Weston Price, Weston Price's book, Nutrition, Physical Degeneration, great source. Um, Meg, did you want to touch on anything in regards to that? Or um, I kind of cut uh, you off there. No, no, no. I, w- I won't interrupt you. You were going on. You can finish what you were saying. Yeah, I, can, I can go on and on for about 20 minutes. <laughs> so, um, did you want to touch on anything else in regards to, did you have a message to get out there uh, in general? Like any advice you would give to people? Uh, just like about things that you found that helped you? Yeah, I would say, you know, a big thing, like my mom, when I was a kid too, some things that she told me, like, which is, is kind of crazy um, to think about now when I watched your videos, because I've never liked seafood, but I've been craving seafood-ish recently. Um, but like my mom would always say, as a woman, especially, you know, with whether you're on your period or whether you're pregnant, if you're craving food, you need to listen to your body. Yeah. And that's something that I always believed when I was a kid. And, you know, like, that's why when I would rarely cheat with my mom, my mom would justify it for me. You know, she wouldn't cheat. She would suffer herself, but she would let her kids eat some things mm-hmm. because she didn't want us to suffer. But, you know, when I'm like now, like, I really do believe, you know, the difference between a craving because and and just like you know having emotional pain and wanting to eat a piece of chocolate cake you know right like there's a difference because when you're craving something say like bacon you can think of eggs you can think of beef you can think of some other whole food like avocado with egg on toast or whatever Mm -hmm. and want it so that means there's something in that food that you want Mm -hmm. and you can eat all sorts of different foods that also have that nutrient you can that's still i'm glad you brought that up still crave it you know like if you you're craving like chocolate, right? And, but say like you think of a cupcake and you're like, I don't want to eat that though. I'm not craving a cupcake. I want chocolate. You know, okay, it's an actual craving your body is telling you. There's something from that I want. And to deny your body, you know, is a very, it's a very stressful thing and it doesn't cause you good. You know, like every time we've been craving foods and we indulged in it, we felt good after Mm -hmm. and like to deny ourselves just because like you know like I guess another thing too would be so I understand the the ethical standpoint right of the planet and the animals um but I think that a really huge problem that's not paid attention to is the multi-trillion dollar industry that's being supported still you know and like the thing is in my grocery store I can like the conventional grocery store um, the only milk, the only milk brand they sell is Dairyland and they sell an organic Dairyland milk. It's okay. like, no, you're st- you don't buy organic that shit. <laughs> Who are you supporting? Are you supporting a farmer? You know, somebody with a family. I'm very grateful. I buy my meat from a family, a literal family. I've met them and they have a ranch and they take care of the animals and they live in harmony with the land and they have shepherd dogs and they go very gracefully very gently helping move the animals around to help the cattle circulate so they don't kill the like the grass they're eating but the thing is the family themselves they have children and they're buying their own food they're supporting themselves with my contribution to helping them well you know and like if you're supporting a farmer who's living in India, who's not allowed to eat his own land, his own food. You know, he's not allowed to eat his own crops. He's in debt thousands to like Monsatan or Bear. You know, like the thing is, these are industries. Monsatan, I like that one. Yes, I only call it Monsatan. Um, But they're making billions and they're you know they're in conjunction with the pharmaceutical industry you know and they're in con- with the healthcare system and they're not taught about nutrition no doctor talks about it your health is in your hands and it's so difficult for these farmers these local farmers to make a living that unfortunately they they try to rip people off in a lot of cases i didn't want to touch on this you know as much as it's nice to talk about you're supporting local farms blah 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 
it's expensive. And the reason it's yes. expensive is because people don't support it. And I get this guy, you know, this Muslim guy that sells me meat. He tries to rip me off every chance he gets. I got to literally weigh the meat myself and add it up and say, you send me this shit. I will take pictures of it. And I weigh it and I pay him what I should be paying him. These people try to take advantage of the prices and sell it because they're having a hard time making a living themselves. Yeah. If I could, if you could sell, you know, if you could sell as much cattle as you needed to, some, some of these farmers have a hard time just selling their products. Others just want to take advantage of you. So as much as supporting local agriculture is nice, I think an unfortunate amount of people have run into these scenarios where it is overpriced, it is a ripoff. But what you have to essentially do is, you know, go out, go to these local sources, find something that's reasonably priced and, and try to make the best of it. And even if you aren't buying food that's reasonably priced, at least try to support the higher quality food. So instead of supporting that grain fed steak, even if you are supporting, yeah. even if you are supporting some Australian government thing, like at least you could buy the Australian grass fed beef, at least put your money into a product that is qu higher quality that you like. It doesn't necessarily have yes. to be from your neighbor's backyard. Yes, exactly. Yeah, for sure. Um, which is ironic. I always thought it was ironic that, you know, the food that takes the least amount of work, the least amount of product to produce is the most expensive because the food that is the most processed, which in, you know, like rationally would cost the most to produce is the cheapest. And how many plants are wasted? That's another thing. Working in a rest, yeah. working in the grocer, half oh, the produce, listen, the, half, I did a video the on, gets um, thrown out. What was the video? I think on my video where I debunked Vegan 2018, the documentary, the main point I had in regards to the environment was the food waste. Because literally yes. a, a quarter of like all food across the board gets thrown out and it's even higher percentages for certain foods. Like I think fish might be a lower percent. I think like certain grains might be higher, but it's definitely unfortunate the amount of food that goes to waste. And if you want to compare the amount of food that goes to waste by the amount of food that can be saved by going vegan, it's it's not comparable. No. Um, yeah. So, that's, Mike, you brought up, I mean, you brought up a lot of great points. You've had a lot of experiences. I think this is overall a, a, an amazing interview from the perspective of, you know, we covered, <laughs> no, I, I, I feel like this is great. We covered aspects, the negatives of a vegan diet that have affected your family all in different negative ways. Every one of you had specific health problems that it's amazing to see it, how it affects different people. And then we had a lot of things that were brought up along the way from the height of your sister to your facial development to relaying that to nutrition during developmental stages. We talked about, you know, the agriculture, local farms. Uh, and I, I think we really covered our bases in regards to convincing people to at least open their mind up to another perspective. This is a video where, you know, we're not bashing the vegan diet. We're not uh, promoting the carnivore diet. We're just talking really about some anecdotal experiences that can be correlated directly to animal foods and plant foods. I would say one last thing too is one size does not fit all. Okay. Like, first of all, I can't eat the diet my boyfriend eats because like in amounts worth, cause he's yeah. a bodybuilder. He's five eleven. I'm five feet tall. You know, I don't, I don't need that many calories. I can't, I can't have that much in my gut. So the same, you know, everything like that, that he's trying to build mass is not going to be the same for me, but also in relation to genetics, I'm, I come from like, I'm over 50% German, you mm -hmm. know, in my genetics and, you know, my whole diet growing up, very heavily German influenced mm -hmm. butter, tons of butter, eggs, um, sausage. I never really liked this, but my older sister really liked Lebertwurst, which is liver on toast. Mm -hmm. Um, but things like that. And then, you know, also where you cut, like where you come from, where you air from the different foods that they ate. There's, I've never heard of a culture that was completely vegan, but I have mm -hmm. heard of cultures that were, you know, mostly vegetarian. They would eat insects, right? Like that's where chocolate covered ants come from. Crickets are delicious, by the way. I love chocolate covered crickets. I know that's weird, but I think they're delicious. They're good mm -hmm. for you too. But um, it's only been like a, a year since I've been eating crickets. They're, they're good though. But there's but definitely something the to, like, yeah, there's definitely something to be said about ancestry and how that ties into how well you can tolerate r ratios of fats in the diet especially animal fats yeah um, what, if you came from you... like brazil or something or it's close to the equator and you are able to eat more vegetarian i think that's doable for some people i think you know having some animal foods is still important because life eats life you know like look at there are carnivorous plants you know the venus flytrap and there are trees as well there are different sorts of things 
plant well, food. Not even just they that. Need, if you, they if need you the leave... decaying animals. You know, the animals yeah. die and they feed the soil. Exactly, yeah. They need, life needs to consume life. That's where and... there's E. coli and all the romaine lettuce. <laughs> There's also E. coli in some vaccines. I, I don't... I'm, I well, I, technically speaking, we want to get into bacteria. There's E. coli on everything right now. So yes. uh, at least some strain of it. So, uh, Meg, this was great. We're coming up on an hour now. So Thank uh, you. I think, I think we'll wrap this up. So <laughs> normally I would do some cutesy goodbye, guys. I would do some wacky stuff. But um, let's just say, uh, where can they find you? Did you want them to see you on Instagram or anything? Uh sure um if you want some people creeping on you on instagram we could do that <laughs> i actually one of the things finding certain like carnivore channels i really liked your channel because i can i have a lot of similar goals i would say um mm. but my instagram is meg.eru.art so m-e-g mm -hmm. period e-r-u period a-r-t i will be having a youtube soon but <laughs> she does body guys she does body painting stuff check it out I, I want my career to be focused around art. So I do do commissions. I don't have a website yet, but I do do commission pieces. Um, but slowly, I want to make my living off of acting, painting, singing, drawing, things like that. That's what I really am good at. So on that note, Meg, can you say something special for all of our German subscribers in German for them? Uh... <laughs> Uh, I'll butcher it. Um, what do you mean? You're saying yogurt and, and liverwurst like it's nobody's business. So, uh, oh, oh, you know, oh, what's the word? Uh, nutritional database, now we're Trekner. I'm butchering it. <laughs> Can you say it? Uh, I don't know. I'm, I'm it's not the N -A best. Oh, so do you, all right. So I'm, I'm not sorry. fluent in German. I do speak a little bit. Ich spreche dein kleine bisschen Deutsch. I'm not fluent, but I will say, um, ich liebe dich to everybody. I love you, All right. I guess. That sounds good to me. That sounds good to me. But thank you guys so much for watching. Um, if you guys would like to support the channel, please subscribe and share the video. Uh, there's a bunch of resources on this channel from other ex-vegan interviews to like vegan versus carnivore nutrient videos you guys can check out if you want to know the science of this. Uh, we also did reference a few things, Weston Price's book in this video. Uh, but if you guys are looking for more in-depth information, just feel free to leave a comment below and I can point you in the right direction. But uh, you guys enjoy uh, the rest of your week, all right? Thank you.